Welcome to Joel Asset News, or Dan for short. My name is Rob, and today is the, the thumbnail and title suggests CPI numbers came in hot, inflation is uh, up, and a little bit more over expectations. And the real question is, is this working, what the Fed is doing? So we'll take a look at uh, those numbers, which I'm sure you already know, but it's just a uh, different set of opinions. Also, we'll talk about the expected Fed hikes, of course, and I want, want to talk, warn you about watch out for December oil and midterms. And then lastly, we're going to take a look at the big picture. And this is a former office officer of the Comptroller of the Currency, Brian Brooks, as he sat down with CNBC. And he gave some pretty compelling information as to where crypto is going as far as with legislation, as far as adoption for institutions, and really what it means right now to be in this market. So first things first, let's take a look at those CPI numbers. I think we all know by now, not doing so hot. Excuse me, it is hot. It's very hot. It's up 0.4%. Uh, this is uh, 0 0.2, I think, over uh, what, what the expectations were. And remember, we've been seeing uh, these Fed hikes for quite some time. And the Fed hikes are supposed to tamper down demand, which will hopefully tamper down inflation. And without these Fed hikes, I can't imagine what inflation would be. And this is just over just a very short amount of time. Take a look at the, at the one year in the five year, and you can see that we're, we're up there. We're going pretty high, but it wasn't anything uh, unusual as far as like 2018, 19, two, 2.25. Take a look at the 10 year, still we're above where we were at 2016, 14, 13. You take a look at 25 years. Okay, now we're talking. And uh, during that 2008, 2009 financial crisis, I mean, we talked about this yesterday, uh, we were almost uh, at six, but if we take a look at max, this is nowhere near. In the 1970s and 80s, uh, you were talking about inflation rates or uh, Fed rate hikes of almost 17, 18, 19 percent. So I don't think we're going to go that high, but just to, to show you how far away we're actually were from the high. And then the big thing to remember, and I think everybody's talking about this, is uh, core CPI. Core CPI takes out food and energy. And of course, right there, that's at 6.6 uh, percent, again, higher than what expectations were. But the big thing I was thinking about was, well, this will probably crush the market for a bit. Nope. If we take a look at the market itself, everything's, I mean, Bitcoin's up 0.2%, which is pretty resilient. And it's been resilient last month too. Uh, and of course, tethering USD coin, no one really cares. But there's a little bit of a, of a red, red area around certain projects, not so much others. Just depends on which ones might be the winners. So Bitcoin, I think, is doing pretty well. 0.3 for, well, it's USD coin. And the question I had then was, well, what's the market's going to do? <laughs> Looks like it doesn't matter. Maybe today it is all priced in. I just don't know if the markets are getting the message like we could go 75 basis points or we could go a full 100 basis points. I know it's out of, uh, out of left field, but I wonder how the market responded to that. But today it's like, yeah, hot numbers are hot. We knew it was coming. Not a big deal. We'll just keep going. I just think there's a little bit more pain, but that's not what the market's saying. The market's like, we want to rally. Here's NASDAQ. And uh, we think everything's going to be just fine. And this is just a temporary thing. And it very well could be. Again, we've got a way to go. And expect the Fed hikes, of course. I personally think it's going to be 75 basis points. I've always said this, but I can't rule out 100. And uh, I know that's very far out, but who knows? We got... November 1st and 2nd with the Fed meeting, that's when they're going to do the, the, the hike. But wouldn't it be crazy if they come out and said, you know what? We can tell things are working because it's going to take some time to work its way through the economy itself, right? It's not like, it's not like getting in shape. Like you do you know, a couple of push-ups and all of a sudden you lose 10 pounds. It doesn't work like that. It takes a little bit of time. It's the same thing with uh, raising, those, raising those rates. I think it's going to take time, 8, 12, 14, 16 months, to really see the effects. And I think at that point, maybe it'll just be a little bit too late. So expect a lot of volatility moving forward. So I think 75 basis points could be it. And of course, the other part about this is the December meeting on 13th and 14th. Because right now, the Fed's looking at the, at the core CPI numbers, right? Which is taking out food and energy. And the reason why energy and gas and things have been down is because, well, we've had a little bit of an increase in production. We've also been uh, getting into our reserves here in the U.S. However, this was a story I didn't really think was going to be much of a thing except for politics, but it's going to play into a, a part. The Saudis 
say the U.S. or OPEC, really. So U.S. saw a one-month delay of OPEC plus production cuts because they are supposed to ramp things up. And they're like, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to decrease the amount of oil that that's produced, thereby raising the demand, thereby raising the cost. And what will that do? Well, of course, the government doesn't want that to happen because guess what happens in the first week of November? That's right, midterms. So they said, please just delay the cuts for a month and so we can get through midterms, we can keep the House or keep the Senate. That's not going to happen. So holding off on cuts would mean implementing them just before the November 8 election, postponing OPEC plus 2 million barrel cut announced last week. And they're like, no, we're not going to stop that. We're going to cut down. So see how that will play it apart. Not in core CPI, but just the CPI numbers in general. And again, I think this could play out very differently than what people think it's going to. So let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And we already know these things, but there was a great interview. And uh, I love these interviews from people like Brian Brooks here. And uh, Brian Brooks, that's a funny picture, is the former officer of the Comptroller of the Currency. He was there from uh, May 29, 2020. And then he lasted, I think, until the next year or so. And um, he was an advocate for crypto. And when you're in that position, it's not like you can say a lot of different things. You can't really just come out and go, you know, these Democrats or these Republicans or this, this and that. But now that he's out of office and I, he's at Fitbury, I believe. Fitbury, Fit, yeah, Fitfury, Fury bit, whatever. CEO uh, for a crypto company. Now he can kind of say the things that are really on his mind and what he really thinks. So what I did is, this is a longer interview. I broke it up into six different pieces and I pre-recorded it because to jump back and forth is going to take too much time. So listen to these six parts, and uh, we'll jump back in a second. But there's a lot of great things. Just take a listen. <laughs> I broke this down into six pieces. This is a fairly long interview from CNBC. And Brian was asked six different questions. And before we start, I just want to make mention that uh, this is probably uh, subpar audio. I don't know why CNBC recorded this interview while there was a live conference going on, but the information that Brian talks about is golden. So the first thing, uh, the first question is this, is what's the chance of regulation in six to 12 months? Second one, what is Congress's issue? Why aren't they moving? Is it consumer protection or something else? Also, what were the lessons learned from 3AC, Celsius, and Voyager, which they're going to take to put into to, uh, new regulations? How are the macro events influencing the market? And how is this good for Bitcoin? Last, second to last is when will Bitcoin rally and decouple? And this is pretty much a great answer from him. And the last one, which I think is the most important, what's the missing piece for mass institution and adoption? I got to tell you, he knocked it out of the park with his last one about where things are going. So let's just go over the first one. And we'll jump in. Kate, what I would say is it depends a lot on the midterm outcomes. So if you assume that the Republicans take one or both chambers, then I actually think the chance of bipartisan legislation is pretty high. And, and, and that is because I think crypto adoption is fairly high. Democrats realize that and Republicans are really leaning in. On the other hand, if the Democrats hold both houses of Congress, the leadership of the Democrats has been quite hostile to crypto assets from the administration and in both houses of Congress. So I think it requires at least one house to change hands for there to be momentum. Interesting. And on the Democrat side, it feels like there has been a little bit of a, a shift in the tone, at least from last year. There's been a lot of talk about consumer protection, but it does seem like they've embraced the industry a little bit more. Could that be the result of lobbying dollars and some of the time that the companies have spent here in D.C.? Yeah, I, I have to say, I think that's happy talk. I, I know the industry says that, but I don't think it's true. You know, there, there's talk from sort of Democratic backbenchers and next-gen leaders, but the leadership of the party, both in the White House and at the regulatory agencies, let alone on the Senate Banking Committee, is uniformly negative. So I just don't see that happening. It's terrific that there's a group of young turf Dems who are on our side, but that's not where the leaders are on that side. So yeah, they're just not very happy with what's going on. It really just comes down to uh, leadership. And even though there's, a, like you said, a lot of young people who want it, there's a lot of people who are up in power like, nope, we don't want that. And the next one, it kind of builds on the last answer is, what's their issue? Consumer protection or something else? Just take a listen. I don't think it was ever consumer protection, Kate. What I, what I, really, what I really think it's about is it's about who controls the financial system. And the crypto movement is all about a user-controlled financial system. And that just isn't what the older generation of Democratic leaders believe in. 
they believe in a more government focused system that can be more easily surveilled, more easily controlled, that can direct people, you know, toward the things that, you know, the leadership believes is good for them. Whereas the younger generation is much more about using technology to unlock value for all Americans. But I, that's just not what the leaders from the 60s seem to believe. Yeah. So again, same thing. And he's right. They don't want to give up that power, but you can see how there is a shift moving on. So I think we're in the right place at the right time. It's just going to take a little bit more time. And the next question is, what were the lessons learned from 3AC, Celsius, and Voyager? I know this isn't a very popular opinion, but just take a listen to what he talks about as far as regulation. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is absolutely yes. And, you know, I, I guess my first thought is, wouldn't it be better if these activities were happening inside of the regulatory perimeter? So, you know, wouldn't it have been better if Three Arrows was regulated as an investment company? Wouldn't it have been better if Terra Luna was subject to banking regulations, right? But for whatever reason, you know, this administration has kept those things outside, which means there's absolutely no visibility into what's going on. You know, a bank would never have had the Terra Luna problem. It would have been seen way earlier. We didn't have that, so that's a problem. And I think the lesson of all of this is better for this to happen with supervision than without. So I know what you're saying right now. You're like, I don't want any regulation. I don't want it. Look. He didn't talk about how they're going to regulate the individual. And yes, people say, well, that's coming, Rob. I, I understand that. However, look, I didn't do anything with Three Arrows Capital. Did you? I didn't do anything uh, that had to do with, uh, with, with Luna and their decisions. Did you? But I did a lot of things that, that happened that was correlated to those issues. So if the industry can get in there and go, you know what? We want to see some of the things you guys are talking about. We want to see some of the data. We want to see some of the reports because we don't believe that that is true. Now, the banks have their own problems, of course, uh, nobody's perfect, but I think honestly, that's a step in the right direction. And I know that people will not agree with me, and I get that, but I just think that uh, there has to be some regulation for us to move forward. And then uh, also in the last or third to last year, the macro events influencing the market and how is this good for Bitcoin? And he, he gave a great answer, and uh, it's something that I really need to start to, to drill into people about what he talks about. Let's just take a listen. Military policy, right? So the Fed is a key driver, but let's look at the war in Ukraine and what it means for all risk assets. So, you know, in the same way that the, Fed, the Fed's hawkishness on inflation is bad for Bitcoin price. And I've been saying this for years. Some of your colleagues have made fun of me for saying, how can you say that? Turns out I'm totally right. But on the side of other macro stuff, let's say that something really bad happens in Ukraine. Like, let's say that the Russians detonate a nuclear weapon as part of their strategy. That'll be great for Bitcoin, unfortunately, because Bitcoin is a last resort when the system fails. So the question is what other things in the system can fail, not just high inflation, but national security or any other macro shock to the system. All of those things, you know, give rise to high Bitcoin prices. So yeah, unfortunately, it's true. I think there's, uh, if those things happen, then again, it just leads us into those uh, horrible macro events where Bitcoin could be. And then also, second to last, we'll talk about when will Bitcoin rally decouple from the traditional markets. Just take a listen. I, I, I totally do. I mean, the times when that's happened have been times of crisis. So if you think about when Bitcoin went from 5,000 to 69,000, it was during the COVID lockdowns, right? When the stock market was going up and down, you know, up slowly, but Bitcoin went up like a rocket ship. It was all because we were in a macro crisis environment and people saw it as a mega safe asset, right? It was a hedge against the end of the world. And that's what it's historically been. When things go back into normalcy, you know, out of a crisis mode, it's a risk asset. And the reason it's a risk asset is because it's thinly traded still today. So the two things that have to happen for Bitcoin to do well are more uncertainty in the world, weirdly, but also broader adoption. And when more people own it, it won't be like any other risk asset. It will trade it for its fundamentals. Yeah, so I don't know about you, but I think uh, the world is uh, due for a little more uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen with Ukraine. We don't know what's going to happen with the uh, prices. We don't know what's going to happen with Nord Stream and Russia and inflation. And there's so much uncertainty. I think this is the time. Now, not to say that Bitcoin's going to go to the moon tomorrow, but it's just a little bit of dominoes that fall along the way. And then lastly, I think this one's the most important. What's the missing piece for mass institutional adoption? And it's not about the question. It's about the answer. It's about the people that are here right now, the people I understand, and getting rid of the trash that's really out there. Just take a listen. Look, on the one hand, there's some surprising positive news, right? Just this morning, BNY Mellon announced that they're going to provide custody support for customer crypto assets. That's a big deal. 
State Street has doubled down on this business over the last couple of weeks. BlackRock announced a Coinbase partnership. Google Pay said this morning that they're going to use Coinbase to clear Bitcoin payments inside of that environment. These are all amazing stories for institutional adoption, but there's still a lot of things missing. I mean, one is we don't have enough bank charters to provide custody support for the asset class. Our KYC and transaction monitoring tools aren't good enough, you know, to really support bulletproof um, sort of regulated activity for asset managers. There's still a lot of things missing. So what I would say, just coming back to your earlier question, is in a world where all of the charlatans have now been flushed out, you know, the three arrows of the world have all failed, what's left is the actual fundamental building. Right. It's just like the 2000 you know, dot com bubble. The stupid ideas get flushed out. The tourists are gone. And what's left is to build an actual decentralized financial system for the world. That's who's left. Ooh. That's right. The stupid ideas get flushed out and the tourists are gone. So if you're here watching this uh, stream and commenting, first of all, thanks for stopping by. You are by no way, in any stretch of the imagination, a tourist. You're here probably for the long haul. And it's going to probably play out pretty well. Again, no one knows the future. But I got to tell you, these are the times when there is prosperous abound. It's just that, it's just who's going to stick around for all this hardship? Because I got to tell you, if you think that tomorrow is going to be awesome or next week or next month, it's not. It's going to get tougher and you're going to see the market slide, and you're going to see these ups and downs. Now, there's going to be bear market rallies. I can, I'm sure of that. But it's not like the April 2021, November 2021 uh, bull market when things just uh, take off like a rocket ship. It just doesn't happen like that. It's a very slow slog. There are no get-rich-quick schemes. It's just every day show up and be that person. So anyhow, that's it for today. So look, let me just think about that in the comments section. Now uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, Q&A and just go over, I'll answer all your burning questions. If you got to take off, take off. You've been here for 16 minutes. That's pretty good. I appreciate you stopping by, but that will do it for today's news. Now let's jump into a little Q&A and go from there. So <laughs> Jupiter. Jupiter says, my lost 40K Luna would like some regulation. Yeah, exactly.